Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HPL Gallery's Artist Talk series. My name is Jennifer, and today I am so thrilled to introduce to you book artist and educator Sarah Bryant. Like many in the field of book arts, Sarah utilizes the form of the book to explore a spectrum of ideas and apply research-based frameworks to her practice. Um, and she's very much grounded in the traditional bookmaking processes such as letterpress printing. So with that, I'll leave it there and turn it over to Sarah to further introduce herself and to share her work with us. Thank you so much for doing this today, Sarah. How are you? Thank you so much for asking me. Um, I'm really good. I'm gonna share my screen just so that um, there's, uh, so that's ready to go. And then I'll talk a little bit more about who I am. Have I managed to share? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I make books. I make books uh, usually under the imprint of Big Jump Press, which I started in 2005 um, when I was a grad student at the University of Alabama, which is where I now teach. So I kind of did a big circle um, and landed back in Tuscaloosa teaching for the MFA Book Arts Program. Um, I'm going to talk about two different projects that I've done in the last um, year or two, and then talk a little bit about some work in progress that is going on right now. And um, I'm calling this talk, this like rough conversation talk, <laughs> conversations with books, partly because the two projects that I'm going to talk about, um, maybe more than any other projects of mine, are really rooted in original texts or in um, source material uh, in the book form. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and launch in. And Jennifer, I hope that if you have any questions while I'm talking, you're feel free to interrupt and, and ask, and then we can treat this like a conversation. So I want to make my slideshow a little bit. There we go. How's that? Beautiful. Good. <laughs> um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is a collaborative project that I produced with a group of women called Shift Lab. And we started making book projects together in 2013. It's five women, um, Macy Chadwick, Trisha Tracy, Katie Baldwin, Denise Bookwalter, and myself. Um, and we are all, we have intersecting interests that kind of um, all involve the book in some way. Um, Trisha is a graphic designer and a bookmaker. Katie and Denise probably identify more specifically with printmaking, but they also make books. And Macy Chadwick is a book artist like myself. Um, and between us, we have a lot of different skills in letterpress, in working with textiles, quilting, graphic design. Um, uh, Trisha is big into using the risograph. There's just a, there's a lot of different things that we do. And so we bring a lot of different stuff to bear on the projects that we make. We've had probably four big book projects since 2013, and then a few smaller printing events and zines and different things like that. And our most recent project is called REF, which you can see here. And REF is an investigation into the reference area, the, the physical reference area of a library. And we were particularly interested in looking at the reference section as it's kind of disappearing from underneath our fingertips. Um, these specific reference types like dictionaries and guidebooks and encyclopedias and chronologies. Um, there are 15 specific reference types um, that I'll talk about in more detail in a minute, but uh, they are in the process of or have already been eliminated by the um, uh, our, our reliance now on algorithmic relevance instead of this kind of specific type of inquiry into these reference texts. So we're, we were interested in that. And the project began because we thought, you know, we've been making projects together for a while and, and we were thinking we would, we might be interested in working with one book, right? Like one book that we have all read or that we could all read and then we could find it in our libraries and talk about like the space that it inhabits in these five different libraries or but but the weight of finding one book you know is it's very hard to make a decision um 
about what that book would be, you know, and it's hard to make a project about the space around a book when the, the book you select, it would take on such a level of importance. And so um, through a lot of kind of trips together and doing different things, we settled on the idea of um, using the reference library. So here you can see a kind of, this is our project. We created a reference section. We created 15 different books and then enclosed them in a flip top document box. And we did all of this in an edition of 50 or 40, I guess. Um, and the inspiration for the project really happened when th the five of us never really get together all together. <laughs> I think the last time we were all together was probably maybe even like 2014 or 2015. It's hard to, one of us is in, well, one of us right now is in Taiwan. Somebody's in California, somebody's in um, New Hampshire, Alabama, Florida. We're never in the same place. Um, but occasionally like two or three of us will get together. Um, and in the middle of the beginning stages of this project, uh, three of us ended up at um, FSU and decided we are just gonna pick the book. We're gonna pick the book that we all need to be reading for this project. And we thought maybe we'll start, we'll just dig around, we'll go down to the, the reference section, the reference area, the library, and maybe we could pick a reference text or something that's a bit broad. And we bumped into a student worker who asked us what we wanted in the library. And we said, we wanted to go to the reference area. And she said, what is that? <laughs> and, uh, and we were, so surprised, you know, I mean, this is somebody who worked in the library. I mean, she was a student worker, so it's not, you know, I mean, she had a lot of things on her plate and she was maybe new and I don't want to vilify this, this poor woman. What did you say? It's uh, unbelievable. <laughs> the thing that's even more unbelievable is that the reference area at FSU, which we did find on our own is enormous. It's so vast, you know, different, libraries will have different definitions of what they're going to hold in their reference sections. And then an FSU, man, you can just see here, these rolling stacks full of um, flat files, full of maps, but it's this vast space in the basement. And immediately, this was uh, Denise Bookwalter who teaches at FSU and Katie Baldwin who teaches at um, University of Alabama Huntsville. She and I, or the, the two, the three of us, we just, we were overwhelmed by this sense of this space, this like huge amount of information, but also the, the kind of infrastructure of that inform information, you know, I mean, the, the architecture of the rolling flat files, the colors of the buckram, uh, you know, that are all those library bindings of, <clears throat> excuse me, different, um, different bright oranges and yellows and blues. And it was just, it's a very, very distinct, space and set of colors that I think took us all to the same kind of mental place. So we were really interested in the reference section um, and all of the kind of beautiful moments you could find in this gigantic, um, but I guess hidden to some <laughs> part of the library. So we said, okay, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna use the reference section. We're not gonna pick a book. We're just gonna, we're gonna investigate the reference section. And part of that interest came from the fact that the student worker didn't know where it was or what it was, you know. And so what is happening right now that, that she could have been standing directly on top of this huge space and never have cause to go down. And of course, you know, we all know why. And it's not wrong to be doing your searches using the tools that are readily available, but still there's this beautiful pile of material that will not be there forever. So I'm going to share, hopefully, this. I'm going to uh, turn the volume down here. Go down volume. OK. I'm going to share uh, a video of the project. And please tell me if it ceases to work. Um, it's, it's not, there we go. I've got arms moving. So if, if you can see it rolling, then that's good. This video is about 12 minutes long. We don't have to watch it all, but I thought I would um, talk a little bit about how we tackled this project while this video is going on so that you can see what's inside. So um, 
I'm going to read to you the, the 15 types of reference material. I'm fortunate in that I teach within the context of a library school. So while I am not a library school, well, I guess I am a library school professor, <laughs> but I'm a book arts professor within uh, that kind of under that broader umbrella. But if that means that a lot of my colleagues are deeply, deeply um, invested in libraries and very knowledgeable about libraries. So I turned to my colleague, um, Dr. John Burgess, who teaches reference. Um, and I asked him a few questions and then kind of took that back to the group. Um, so the 15 types of reference material are the almanac, the atlas. In fact, I'm gonna say them and, and give you the de definition because some of them are not as clear as others to the, to the average human being. So almanac is usually a one volume work with statistics and comp uh, compilation of specific facts, an atlas, a book of maps and geographical information, a bibliography, a compilation of sources of information, a biographical dictionary, sources of information about the lives of people, usually in short entries, a chronology lists the events in order of the date on which they occurred. A concordance is an alphabetical listing of keywords or phrases found uh, in the work of an author or work in a collection. A dictionary defines words and terms, confirms spelling, definition, and pronunciation. Directory lists names and addresses of individuals, companies, organizations, and institutions. An encyclopedia covers knowledge or branches of knowledge in a comprehensive but summary fashion. A gazetteer is a dictionary of geographical places without maps, no maps. A guidebook provides detailed descriptions of places um, intended primarily for the traveler. A handbook treats one broad subject in brief or gives a survey of a subject. An index lists citations to scholarly and, uh, scholarly and popular articles and proceedings. Manual is a specific work that tells how to do something uh, or how something operates. And a yearbook covers the trends and events of the previous year. So that's a lot, right? Um, and what we did was we decided that we were gonna create a reference section, but we were gonna organize it around a rough set of dates. Um, and those dates would have a relationship to the transition from the kind of physical use of the reference section toward what's happening now, where we're using algorithmic relevance, where we're using keyword searches. And if you'll just forgive me for a second, I had this pulled up on my other computer over here, but I wanna be sure to use the right language when I talk about this. Those dates are, well, I can't find it. How about that for a talk? But they're, they're uh, 19, I think 1963 was the release of the King Report, which was um, a report on automation to the Library of Congress. Then we were looking at 1991, which is the Gore Bill, which popularized the World Wide Web, and also was the release of Mosaic, which was the uh, first web browser. We were looking at um, 2001, which is the uh, beginning of Wikipedia. Uh, and there's also another date in the 90s where there was another automation report, and I can't remember specifically what that date was. So we went to reference sections and we just started kind of investigating what we could find using those dates, using the King report, um, which is that automation report, so that we would have certain things in common amongst these 15 books. We also gathered, four of us were able to gather in Huntsville in May of 2019, is that right? Maybe May of 2018. And we ended up mocking up the entire project. So dividing up the labor, deciding who was gonna be working on which aspect or which component to the REF project. Some of us were gonna work in uh, collaboration on different pieces. Some of them would be done individually, um, but we came up with some mock-ups and then we all left Huntsville kind of with a plan for what we were gonna do. Uh, and then we spent the next six months just kind of cranking out the project. This video, which I, um, of course, have on mute so that I can talk to you, I, I have up on Vimeo, and there is a voice, my voice, in fact, um, talking a little bit about each of these components, like where the, 
what the source material was, what the inspiration was for each of the components and how it might work with the others. So there's, there is a lot more information on this project, as you can imagine when you're working with a, it's, it was a big project for us. So I think, let me see, I think I'm going to skip ahead, except maybe I'll I wonder if I can catch the, oh, this is Katie's dictionary. Katie's dictionary, I'm going to go back and show because it's something I, I really like. What she did is she found um, for each of these years, what words were added to the dictionary in those years. And so she provided these sample sentences and um, a really fun, this is all letterpress and screen print, um, but kind of a fun, she was thinking about it as like a learner of a language kind of playing around with writing sample sentences and all those kind of stuff. So it's, it's a really, I think it's a beautiful, it's, a, it's just beautiful. So, so all, all, uh, all five of us cranked this project out and then brought it all together. So I'm gonna pause this slide, see if I can get out of here. No, I'll never get out. Just a moment. Bear with me. There. Oh, okay. I was a bit worried that we were just going to be trapped in my technical glitch forever. <laughs> so here you can see for all of our projects, as you know, it's, it takes a lot of organization. So we have a Google Drive, and so this is one of the first things we put together, which is who's going to take on what component, who else is going to collaborate with that person, um, and all of this had to be done relatively quickly because the book needed to be finished for the Codex book fair and symposium, which was in February of 2019. So this is the 6th of May, 2018. So it was a lot of work <laughs> that we did between that mock-up session and the final, um, the book fair where we had the book finished. Here are just some images. This is the almanac, um, which was done using language from the best, like Uncle John's best days um, in combination with the King Report, some language from the King Report. We've got the Atlas, which was inspired um, in part by the a pro, an online project. Oh, I won't remember the names of the artists right now called Wind Map. It's really quite beautiful. You can find it. It just charts winds in um, the United States. Uh, and some language came from the BBC shipping forecast. And here's the Gazetteer which Katie Baldwin put together. So I worked on the Atlas and she worked on the Gazetteer, but they went together, they were paired. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, bibliography, uh, which I put together, uses images of our mothers and lists all the sources that we used for the project. I really like the photographs in that one. And, oh, and in, oops. you incorporate them and and are just you're just giving a visual like slice of the eyes yeah we, i used so those are your mothers mm -hmm. yeah there are five mothers so there you there are images of the eyes and mouths mm. um and yeah <laughs> it's kind of like oh, and it, it, it the way it's put together it feels fluid like you it, it i'm not sure if the if that um we made it to that component in the video or not, but it kind of just flows. Yeah. Um, and so there's something about rivers and sources and mothers and all of that seemed to be something I wanted to put together. I just got a notification from Alabama Power, which is great that my power might go out in the next 30 minutes. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're just gonna keep on rolling here. We'll see what happens. This is the concordance. Macy Chadwick put this one together. The concordance is like an early keyword search Right. Um, and so it's also that means it's the first type of um, ma reference material that kind of disappeared. And um, let's see, and the chronology here, just a detail. Um, Denise Bookwalter did this wild thing for the encyclopedia, because how do you do an encyclopedia? How do you make a brief investigation into an encyclopedia? So what she did was she um, Google has scanned images of the first encyclopedia, which was produced in 1771, I think. It's Encyclopedia Britannica. Britannica. Um, and Denise took every page and layered it and then made an etching plate 
from it and then printed it and then scanned it and then ordered a yard of fabric. So you have this sort of massive, dense, uh, you know, I, I just think it's such an interesting way of thinking about an encyclopedia. This is like this density of information that she printed on fabric. I thought I had another image, but I don't. So it's kind of like a banner or a tablecloth? Like? It's like, it's like a square, yeah, it's like a square uh, yard. Mm -hmm. So it folds up to this like kind of book size and feel, you know, but it's all, it's like very inky. You know, it's all black. Yeah. Wow. It's beautiful. Uh, this is the guidebook and Katie Baldwin did this one thinking of it as like a guide to the reference area. So it's all the Buckram. She went through her reference library, the Salmon Library in Huntsville, found books published in the years we were thinking about, and then made a chart by color. Of, and they're all, um, you know, reference text is quite it's beautiful. These colors are part of what drew us in. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is just, the, yeah, and there you can see, I mean, you can see those colors, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and so here, I, I just, the uh, last little image to just talk about how timely this was for us anyway. Um, we started this project by visiting our own reference areas. So this on the left is the reference area at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, where I teach. And on the right is Katie's library at the University of Alabama Huntsville. And we spent a lot of time in that space, you know, researching when we were putting the mock-ups together for the book. But before we were even finished with the project, before the book fair, before any of that, this is what happened. Both of those reference areas were removed. I mean, we could not have made this project six months after we started. You know, now they're communal gathering spaces or whatever they're doing to reference areas these days, you know, and it's not, I don't want this to be like a binary, like some kind of simple, like, oh, it's so bad that they're taking the books away because <laughs> it's world, the world is complicated. And these spaces were not being used by anyone other than us. You know? <laughs> so, so now they have a new purpose and a new life and that's okay. But, but there is a loss. Um, it and sure I think occurred physically, you know, mm -hmm. it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that is REF. That is that project. Um, what how long have I been talking? Okay. Just 19 minutes. All right, great. So so I'm going to talk now. I'm going to shift gears completely and talk about a completely different book. And I, I don't think it'll take me as long because it doesn't have 15 components. And then I'll talk about some work in progress. Um, so the Radiant Republic. This is a project I did on my own. Um, as Big Jump Press, Big Jump Press being my, you know, secret name, or my my superhero name. I don't, I don't know my press. Well, name. And book artists do that, right? They establish a press to release the books from. So yes, yeah, and it is very helpful because you know there are certain things I want to do as Big Jump Press, and there's certain things I want to do as Shift Lab, and there's certain things I want to do just as Sarah Bryant. And it's nice to be able to kind of divide up my activity in that way. So, it kind of adds a, you know, a level of like form formality to it too. Yes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And also sometimes it's nice to take your name out of it a bit, you know, um, like I, I mean, my names are all, you know, all over my books and I sign my books, but, but there, I consider myself a publisher of, you know, this is, mm -hmm. I don't know, the act of publication makes me a press rather than a, um, I don't know, it's complicated, but I have, I have a press name. So the Radiant Republic, is another project that relies heavily on these sort of other sources. And in this case, um, this book, which is a project, and I call it a book, even though it's a box full of cement shapes and some booklets on top. Um, this book is about architecture. It's about urban planning, sort of, and it's about ethics. And the text, which is a five-part city building narrative is built completely out of language that I excerpted from Plato's Republic and Le Corbusier's Radiant City. So both of these texts are um, concerned with using this, the city as a way of prescribing or describing morality. So for Plato's Republic, it's kind of a metaphor for how to talk about ethics. And um, Le Corbusier really wanted to build these 
urban spaces that dictated a lot or prescribed a certain type of behavior. So the, these two texts had a lot in common for me, even though they are separated by 2000 years. Um, and I, I came to them, um, I, I, I usually read around a lot of, you know, I read around a subject a lot before I'm ready to make a book or I'm ready to think about what the book might be. And in this case, I, I started the project thinking about uh, the idea of an ideal form or truth generally, like this was 2016 that I started this project and everything kind of changed a little bit in 26 or a lot in 2016. And so I was thinking about people who want to build perfect societies or prescribe behavior and what all that was about. And I started by thinking about the platonic solid. Um, and platonic solids, which are these geometric shapes you can see inside of this box, um, are a set of five geometric forms that are equilateral shapes set at equilateral angles. They have, they have been kind of considered these objects of perfection because of their shape, because of the nature of their shape, which is like it, all, everything's equal. They're often used as dice uh, in games. There's this perception of like justice and fairness that accompanies them. And there are templates all over the internet for how to make the shapes. So there's this idea that you too can make a perfect object. Um, and all you have to do is get a piece of paper and start folding. But of course, no one can make a perfect thing. There's no such thing as a perfect thing. And so I started being interested in those shapes. And so just making those shapes and folding them and crumpling them and waxing them and photographing them and reading. So uh, Plato wrote about the platonic solids. I started reading different dialogues um, of Plato and landing back at the Republic, which I hadn't read for a long, long time and was so deeply disturbed by the language in, the, you know, it's a very, um, worrying. <laughs> so, so it's kind of interested in that. At the same time, I started reading a text called On Weathering. A friend of mine who's an architecture professor suggested that I read this text about the finishing stages of any structure being the weathering process. Um, and that was such an interesting book. And it took me to Le Corbusier because so much of the, this kind of co the concrete um, facades and how they change over time was very interesting to me. And so Le Corbusier, who wrote The Radiant City, immediately I just started hearing or, or identifying this kind of similar language that was coming out of both of these texts. And so it's it's a... I'd have to talk for a lot longer about it to speak specifically to exactly why all of that was true. But there are a few things that jumped out immediately. I'll go to a different slide. Ah, here we are. Um, one is that both of these texts were really male. And I know that that's really no surprise given the time periods <laughs> when they were written. But, uh, but I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop seeing it. It was so male, so male. All of it, gentlemen, this and... Um, it's just so masculine. Secondly, both of these texts, of course, as I already said, we're talking about this, the city in a particular way. But then also both of the language, the language that they were using was very manipulative. So Plato is always using the Socratic method, which is a way of setting up an argument that you're going to win, <laughs> which is, you know, there are flaws in presenting your argument in, in that way. And it's full of language like, do you not agree that blah, 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 blah? Or is it not true that la, 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 la? And of course, to, to disagree, you have to really, <laughs> you got to jump in there and immediately have a confrontation. There's no room for you, you know. And Le Corbusier, his language was very, um, he used a lot of typographic choices, like all caps or italics or like a thousand exclamation marks and really kind of beating you into submission through the, just the structure of the, the way that he was um, writing this text. So anyway, those, there were these, there were these kind of these connecting points for these texts. And I'm, I'm going to stop talking about it because I feel like there's just so much to say, but um, that maybe will be for another day. But um, I have a quick video here, which hopefully again will work. Um, and this is only two minutes long. 
uh, that just shows me handling the book. Just so many of these projects, are it's hard to see from images what they look like. So you lift off the lid and then there's a wrapper that has a narrative. Um, and then it, there's the box, a pane of glass, and then poured concrete shapes. There are five uh, platonic solids. I didn't use all five. I used three and I used different sizes of them, you know. Um, so then you can, excuse me, open the book. There is an epigraph from On Weathering that I'll read in a minute. And then you have these pamphlets that have a scoring pattern on the covers. Um, uh, a five-part narrative that is meant to be read like cyclically, you know, let us, we need to build a new city. Here's our new city. Our city is terrifying. Our city is destroying itself. We need to build a new city. It kind of goes, <laughs> goes in a circle. And then a landscape inside that is also meant to be cyclical. So you can see here in the video, I'm kind of uh, paging through um, and showing how these landscapes interlock. And the landscapes also are you know, the end connects back to the beginning. So the, you know, part five, which you see on the right, um, can connect back to the first part, which we'll see right there. All right, now let's, let's do this dance where I get out of the, yeah, well, well I've left the whole slideshow now. So I'm just gonna move ahead. Oop. So here are the um, pamphlets. The flax, it's a handmade flax uh, cover, you, not handmade by me, I commissioned it from the Morgan Conservatory, but you can see the text through the scoring pattern. Every physical thing carries within its deepest layers a tendency toward its own destruction is the epigraph that comes from on weathering. And then you you saw this in the video, interlocking imagery. And on the back page of each of the pamphlet, there's a, a, a bit of text that you can read that is meant to kind of direct you to the next. So there's a tiny portion of text. For example, on the first pamphlet, there's a tiny portion of, sec of text that you'll see in the second. And it takes you through and kind of emphasizes that cycle. And then the shapes, these concrete forms, nine in each box, meant I was hoping to be to to be played with. It's like a you can build your own city kind of thing. And I had an exhibition in Huntsville where I got to build a big sandbox and put I don't know how many dozens of these in the sandbox. And it was so nice because people actually did build cities. You know, I, my friend. Uh, sent me photos of of the the these solids all in different orientations, and so it was really pretty satisfying. And then that was all over, and I brought the sandbox home, and now Milo can play with it. So, <laughs> so that's that. Milo is my kid. Okay, so those are those two big projects. I'm just going to talk for two seconds, or a little more than two seconds, about work in progress. Um, I'm always working on a bunch of different stuff, so I'll just zing through a couple of quick things. One is this project that I started before COVID, and I, it's like I don't even know what this project is anymore because now all of our lives are so different. But I was thinking about fabric samples um, and paint samples, and I got to do a research trip to the uh, Beer and Color Collection up at Yale, uh, which is where this photograph was taken and just go through boxes and boxes of fabric samples and paint samples. And it was wonderful. I had the most wonderful time. And I was thinking about my own stuff. Um, so I had selected clothes and sheets and paint color from my walls. And it's so funny because I was making this project, initially I was thinking about it as like, we never spend time at home, right? <laughs> you know? And uh, then this happened and I've been in my home for a year and so now I don't even really know what I'm going to do with this project. I want to finish it, but I don't know what it is anymore. But a part of it for me is an interest in using what you have around you. Um, part of it is just a long interest in sample books and matching colors. Part of it is what it is about these things, these 
clothes that meant I saved them. Like the one, this orange on the left is this vest I wore in high school and I could never throw away. So now I'm finally able to cut it up because I'm putting it into some other permanent form. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know, like, what is it that's important about that? I'm not sure. I'm also interested in thinking about color, the color industry as being a kind of part of the origin story of planned obsolescence and landfill culture, like buying your, your objects in new colors every year, you know? So there's something about that that I'm interested in. But like I said, this project is just so unformed now. Like it had a direction and then it, it, it lost its direction because of all of us being at home or those of us who were able to be at home being at home. Um, and also part of this was me thinking about, I, I might make a color, I might make a sample book and then I'll make collages, I'll like edition collages using my clothes, the thread, using paper that I've had for 10 years that was a gift, you know, just trying to like, what, what am I, what am I doing? I don't know. I honestly don't know. So that's this project. The second project that I want to mention is a new shift lab project that we're working on now called Multiple Discovery, where we are all, in fact, behind me, these, these prints that are drying are for this project. And so um, what we're interested in doing is, is making a project that's a little bit more integrated. So rather than each of us making components, we're going to print these sheets that have certain formal elements in common, color choices. We've like ordered pre-mixed ink and we have selected a horizon line. And then what we're going to do is we're all printing these projects with the idea of multiple discovery in our minds. So multiple discovery is the idea that, um, that the same sort of invention tends to pop up in multiple locations at the same time. Like the, it kind of blows up the myth of the sole inventor. It's like, it's all about the conditions that yield um, a simultaneous invention. So we're thinking about that as sort of a metaphor for collaborative practice from a distance. So that's where, that, those are kind of our, our basic baby thoughts about this. Um, originally, we had planned on printing all of these sheets and then gathering and staging events in five different places and binding the edition differently five different times. So it's an edition of 50 and there'll be 10 copies that look like this and 10 copies that look like this and 10 copies that look like this using the same material. But since we can't do that now, we're planning on collating all five of us collating like a sub edition. So my edition which will use everybody's prints, but will look a little bit different from Trisha's version of the edition. So this is a mock-up. It won't look anything like this, but um, that's what we're working on. And then finally, I'm interested in um, collaborating with a lot of different people about the idea of um, translation, how we all think about translation. So I'm talking to a biology professor and I'm going to talk to a type designer and I'll talk to other people and then make a series of small projects that kind of are meant to work together to speak about the act of translation. So I think that is like, that is enough about all of that. So all this just by way of saying that I've always got like a bunch of stuff going on I'm always working on too many projects at the same time. Um, I love working with other people. That's what, you know, helps me enrich what I do. Um, and so I think that that is probably where I'm going to end. Okay. Well, I have a question for you. Um, let's see. So within the book arts field, how have you seen discussions around what a book is evolve? Um, and by discussions, I mean artwork practices and artworks. So how does your work participate in this dialogue around the form of the book? And just to kind of flesh this question out, you know, like the, it's especially with um, the Plato book. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name right now. Oh, it's, the, it's fine. It's the Radiant Republic. Republic, like that, as you mentioned, like that's doesn't take on a traditional form of the book. And this seems to be something that is like played with and is book artists are very curious about, um, about like discussing um, what a book is as they're making a book. So I wonder if you would talk about that a little bit. 
It's an interesting question. And it, in, in a way, it's kind of hard to answer because I'm just like living and breathing inside thinking about books all the time. But I, I think I'll answer first just by talking about Shift Lab a little bit. Like one of the things that we got together to do was not just to make books, but to expand what we think of as the book. So with every project that we do, we also try and build a non-book component. Like Ref is a little different because it's just like this huge thing, but our other projects have involved events or uh or, or just exhibitions, you know, thinking about the print and the book, the relationship between a print and a book. Um, so, and at home for me with my own big jump press, I guess at home means big jump press <laughs> right now, but for me, you know, I'm, I live in a book project for two years. Like it takes a long time to go from the very beginning to the finished book, if I ever do finish. Mm -hmm. the book. And so I think about the book as as the kind of core of a project, but then I'm making prints, I'm making, you know, a sandbox, I'm making, I'm, I'm sort of using the book as a way of focusing my activity, but then I'm building, I'm, I'm kind of creating a world around and outside of that book. And I guess when I see people, you know, I see a lot of artists who are making books, but there's, there are so many different ways to be interacting with a book. There's so many different ways to be thinking about what a book is. You know, is it, is it the, is the, is a book divorced from the content inside of the book? Is the book just about passing on information? Um, what happens when you make a book so big that you can walk through the book? What happens when you make a book so that you can't open it? You know, I, I, there's so many different ways that people make art about the book. I think that I use the book form because I like to control how people are engaging with the work that I'm making. So, you know, and it's time-based so I can give people a narrative or a sequence and I can, and I think that that's, that's something that anybody who's using the book form is interested in like guiding people through their thought, their process or their, their, um, you know, whatever their conceptual foundation of their project is, you have a way of, giving people uh, uh, the tools to navigate that work. So I think those are all at the core of why you would elect to use the book format. But then there's these other questions about like what kind of school of bookmaking, you know, <laughs> are you coming out of, you know, there's a fine press movement. A lot of what I do is a, is very, um, craft-based and skill-based. So I'm using letterpress. I'm binding books by hand or casting cement by hand, you know, depending on the project. <coughs> and that is kind of connected to a love of process and um, an interest in craft. And, but there's nothing that says I can't make the work I make in a zine you know and go and photocopy it and send it out in 12 different ways and like, for example shift which i keep talking about shift lab we made a newspaper about one of our projects and so there's mm -hmm. this component to the project that is this totally other thing and i like the idea of being able to build things out bigger and bigger and broader and broader but i do think my my home where i'm most comfortable is when i personally can make a project um, I can mix my ink, I can bind the book and I can lay it in front of people as a physical object. Mm -hmm. It was a meandering answer. And I'm not sure that if, if it was helpful. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that that clarifies a lot, you know, and I was just kind of hoping that my question kind of like brought out that, um, that very like interesting um, thing that the book arts field does which is like, it's grounded in the book and yet there's no rules. And it's also about breaking those rules and seeing how you can creatively do that. And even by like remaining very, very like dedicated to the form of the book and bringing in new concepts that haven't been used before or by like, just like playing with the form yeah. and the object. But it's very much about like information, about yeah. the sharing of information. I think it's like one, feel bad i've suddenly got realized i've got oh, i'll bring us back um or go or you go ahead i'll stop my share yeah i um i think I, I one question i ask myself a lot um 
is can you make can you make a book an artist book without it being about the book right <laughs> like is there a way to get outside of the the I don't know, just this identification of book it's within. It's referential right. thing. That it's yeah, exactly. Does. But painting does that too. You know? Right, of course, of course. It, it, yeah. It's funny though, I think because the book world is so tiny, you know, um, I don't think the book, the book world is only tiny when you're only talking about people who only make books. Like there's so many artists working all over the place that have also made books. And so in that way, it's a broader, you know, it's a broader, it's a broader world that they're, they're kind of dipping into books while they're making other projects. But yeah, I, I just, I just love making books. Oh God. Now I've just, <laughs> don't let the power go out now on that note. <laughs> we'll wrap. We're, we're good. We'll wrap before we get zapped on your power. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed this, Sarah, um, especially even like the, your talk about ship lab and that ref book. I don't think I'd seen that on your site before. And so oh, I'm glad, I'm glad that I brought something new to uh, it. I just really love that project a lot. And I think that that's like rooted in my obsession with the tactile physicality of libraries that you yes. all responded to, you know, so. Yeah. I, I really, that, that project, I'm very proud of it. And it's like here, I've got a, you know, I've, I've got the, we divide our labor, you know, so sometimes one person ends up with the addition and ships them out and sometimes someone else. And usually, usually the person who finishes the binding ends up sitting on the stack of books, you know, and in this case it was me. And so I've got them all kind of piled up um, over there. And I just, I really like that it was a, it, it almost killed us. It was too many components and too short a timeline and the box was complicated to make and all that, <laughs> all that good stuff. But, um, but in the end, I feel like it's a really good, it's a rich project with a lot of people thinking about um, the same material, but in a lot of different ways. So. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks again. Thank and you. We'll say farewell. Uh, thanks for listening or watching and um, we'll say farewell. Okay. Bye. Bye.